Okay, welcome to the 1619 Project Discussion. This is uh, September the 16th, and Brian Beery is our special guest today. This meeting is being recorded, so if you're in a witness protection program, you might want to take some precautions, but um, uh, the recording, everybody should accept the note there that says that you're being recorded. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. So Brian, take it away, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dick, and thanks for uh, providing me with this opportunity uh, to speak to the Pasadena Village uh, one more time. Uh, just to kind of bring us all up to speed, uh, last time we ran out of uh, minutes in the day to be able to cover everything that we wanted to. What uh, Dick and I had discussed in the meantime was uh, to bring uh, maybe a couple of new stories or stories that we didn't discuss last time and then to provide the opportunity for us to have a discussion. So I'm hoping that everyone will be uh, active, engaged and energized and uh, willing to participate. And um, as far as participation, it's thinking about your own personal story, your family stories, your uh, personal experience and to be also thinking about, as um, some of you were discussing earlier, uh, Dick and Sharon in particular, but what's happening today? How are these historical artifacts, uh, these historical experiences, how are they being manifested today? And then what is our, um, what are our options as far as action, um, activism, um, uh, education, uh, awareness, inspiration, uh, how might we be vectors of change uh, in this continuing process of, uh, I would say, uh, evolution or um, awareness on the part of the community and then uh, action to actually become a, uh, a fully inclusive, diverse and equitable place to live. So um, I will, I will, I'll, I'll cover a little bit of territory that we, we covered originally, uh, but then I'm going to kind of diverge off into new stories that uh, exemplify some of the problems with historic racism, um, marginalization, discrimination, uh, and practices that uh, everything from Jim Crow uh, to racial covenants. So, uh, I, I hope this is uh, informative to you and, um, and engaging. Uh, Dick, uh, I don't know if you're still there, but apparently there are some people who are still trying to get on. I just received a, a message. Um, it looks like Dick maybe went to lunch. Uh, so- No, oh, I'm here. Um, can you accept- uh, there's, we don't have a waiting room, so there's no, I don't know, the, the, the link should bring people in. The link that I sent out has the passcode in it, and people should be able to get in with no problem. I'm not sure what the issue is. Okay. If they have the link, it just should bring them in and put the passcode in because that's embedded in the link. Okay. Well, I'll... I had to uh, type in the passcode, even though I do have the email with the link. Okay, well, the passcode is just the word passcode, all lowercase. Right. right. So you could tell people that if that's the problem. And I can put the I can put uh, the link into the chat. If uh, Brian, do you know how to get the link? Um, if you're getting emails, you could send them the link. Yeah, I have it. Okay. Uh, I'm just forwarding your email. Okay. And uh, I believe it was it was either Sharon or Dorsey uh, mentioned a film that is out right now um, and is on PBS called uh, Can We All Get Along? And so the director of the film would like to participate today. Um, so hopefully that works. Uh, in any event, uh, let's get started and hopefully he will uh, figure out how to join the call. And I'll be 
so I'll be sharing my screen. I'm going to be showing you some images and um, some, again, some artifacts. And then uh, we'll break and have a little bit of a discussion. And then we'll jump back into it. So um, is everybody OK with that? Yeah. And we might, uh, we might use all the time. We might finish a little bit early. It depends how talkative you are. If, if you're all um, uh, ready for a conversation, we'll have lots to discuss. So the, where we're going to start is, again, kind of a review of what we talked about last time. And it's the, the Brookside Plunge. And actually, let me do something real quick. I want to um, kind of participate with you or have some sort of an interaction with you. So I'm going to uh, ask you to either respond verbally or just um, type in the chat and maybe we could have a chat monitor. Anybody feel, Pablo, since you're here now, maybe you could be a chat monitor. Uh, uh so, uh, sure. What? How do you do that? Oh, I just keep just keep an eye on the chat. I mean, yes, that's all. Uh, you have okay. To do. Nice. All right. All right. So let's dive right in, literally and figuratively. Uh, and, and again, there, there's going to be a slight bit of review from our last conversation. So Brookside Plunge, uh, the pool was built in 1914. That's in the background. That's Linda Vista, um, which many of you recognize. This is uh, early 1920s. It was a, a donated by a, a wife of an investment banker, uh, Mrs. Everett Willington Brooks, and donated about $3,000 to the city of Pasadena to build the pool. Um, immediately, immediately in 1914, the city prohibited people of color from uh, swimming in the pool. There was a precursor group to uh, the NAACP and they went to city council and said, uh, you know, we don't, we don't appreciate this. We want you to open up the pool. The pool, the um, city declined and uh, kept it closed for uh, about five years. When the NAACP formed in 1919, uh, they again petitioned the city and the city came up with as a solution uh, what's known as International Day. This is a photograph from about 1933 at the pool. Um, International Day, again, a, a quick review of what we talked about la two months ago, was um, a one day a week when people of color could swim in the pool. So this is all encompassing um, uh, African-American, Mexican-American, Korean-American, Japanese-American. Uh, that was the only day they were allowed. Whites were allowed in the pool every other day, two to five in the afternoon on Wednesdays. And then after the pool closed, uh, five o'clock, uh, then the, the water would be drained and new water would be filled in for Thursday morning for the white patrons to be able to use it. What I want to describe right now is how does that impact um, individuals? How does that impact um, a people um, and I'm going to uh, share a case with you that uh, specifically demonstrates um, racial exclusion, but then also the, the impact and then the loss. I want you all to be thinking about what is, what is the, the real loss? If we, have a, uh, if we have a discriminatory or racist society, uh, what do we lose as a result of that as a society? What do we not uh, uh, key into what do we not um, realize as, as a community when we limit access uh, to certain members of society. So just be thinking about that in general terms. If you want to throw something in the chat, uh, feel free to do so as we're talking. So um, any of you uh, know who Sammy Lee is? I see yeah. a couple of nodding heads. So we're going to talk. We're going to talk about Sammy Lee specifically in regards to the Brookside Plunge. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the story, uh, two-time Olympic gold medalist in the ten-meter platform diving in uh, London and Helsinki. Uh, uh, another added note is that he won a bronze medal as well in the three-meter uh, springboard diving uh, in Helsinki. So he's a three-time um, Olympic medalist. He, he had an extraordinary career. 
Um, he just passed um, 2016. He was 96 years old. He was born in 1920. He grew up in, and here, here's some of his other accomplishments. He became a physician. He practiced medicine. He was an ear, nose, throat specialist uh, and served, you know, the broader kind of uh, Pasadena, Eagle Rock, Highland Park area where he grew up. And he, uh, but on the side, he continues coaching. And one of the reasons why he continued coaching after he retired from diving was because uh, his coach had donated his time. He was coached for many years by the same coach who did not charge uh, Sammy Lee any funds. So Sammy grew up in Highland Park. So the, the pool, the, lo the closest pool that had a 10 meter platform was the Brookside Plunge. Uh, that meant that Sammy could only use the plunge one day a week because he, uh, he's a Korean American. So what did his coach do? His coach said, you know what, Sammy, we need to be practicing all the time. So one of the strategies we're going to use is I'm going to, uh, dig a hole in my backyard and I'm going to dig a sand pit. We're going to put some two by fours out for a diving board. I think later on they improved the diving board. Uh, but Sammy practiced in his coach's backyard diving into a sand pit. <laughs> how, how is it that, so again, what do we lose as a society? How is it when we do not provide access, complete and full access to everyone in society to resources especially ones that are public if the brookside plunge was you know the valley hunt club or it was a uh, annandale golf uh club then you would you know they would have uh, more of a um uh, kind of a foundation to stand on to privatize the club and to prohibit access but this was a public facility uh donated with uh you know money that was utilized for public benefit so um International Day uh, made it very difficult for Sammy to um, practice, and yet, and yet he earned three medal, Olympic medals, and then went on to study at Occidental College. Uh, he also studied, he earned his uh, medical degree at USC. So I, I wanna go into this just a little bit more deeply for a second, and then, then we'll pause for some comments, and I, because I wanna know what your thoughts are. So, um, he went to Franklin High. Uh, Franklin, uh, as you all know, is in the Highland Park and it's pretty close to Pasadena. There was in, in 1937, he's a senior in high school, 17 years old. There was a meet that was scheduled. So a competition that was scheduled at Brookside. His uh, uh, immediately, uh, obviously because he's Korean American, he's not allowed to go. So his principal, uh, Fred uh, Axe, our vice principal had sent a letter to the city of Pasadena, uh, to the Recreation and Parks Department. In the letter, they said, would you please allow Sammy to participate in this competition? He has a tremendous potential. He's, um, he's a fine young man, et cetera, et cetera. What you see on the screen is the city of Pasadena's response. So, and I've uh, blown it up a little bit here. So. Uh, and I'll, I'll just read it real quickly. It is true that we have established International Day, uh, and in this letter, it's Tuesday each week throughout the summer season at Brookside. And actually it was all year long. It wasn't just, well, it was the entire time that Brookside was operating. When persons of all nations, and I want you to pay attention to the language that's used here, persons of all nations use our swimming pool. Other than that, on that particular day, we draw a very decided line. However, in view of the situation, as long as those in your group, in your group, are willing that this Korean boy swim with them, we will allow him to pass for that day only. So uh, a couple of aspects this, of this to point out there, the city is adamant that it will not, and there's another story I'll tell a little bit later that um, that's retaliatory in nature by the city against uh, community members. Um, but uh, the city is very adamant that it's not going to bend the rules for a, a, um, some people would call them these days an Olympic hopeful uh, to be able to utilize the pool. Uh, and another part is that they, they're very clear about who is allowed 
to use a pool and who is not allowed to use a pool. So one of the reasons why I wanted to bring up this uh, story about Sammy Lee is because it, it demonstrably shows, because a lot of times we talk about, oh, International Day, you know, and that was a long time ago. And, um, you know, it, you know, some, some people might diminish its uh, impact, but this uh, demonstrates how stubborn the city was in um, being inclusive, uh, in particular around International Day. So what I'd like to do, um, uh, one other comment uh, by Sammy was um, the inescapable racism uh, inspired me to, uh, to pursue my career and uh, and I was going to prove that in America I could do anything. Uh, so he, he was well aware of the discriminatory practices in his day and um, still persevered uh, to um, accomplish what he had. So what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll take off the, the, the PowerPoint for a minute. I'd like to open us up for a little bit of a conversation. So some questions that you might be thinking about answering um, you know and a lot of this is how do you how do you feel about all this uh, but why do you think the city of Pasadena uh, created International Day to, and I'd, I'd like people to be very specific about this because um, it, it's uh, if we think more in general terms um, I think that we miss some of the impact and then how, how do you feel about that the city of Pasadena instituted this day? What impressed you about Sammy's story? And then um, how might you have responded or reacted if you were in uh, Sammy's shoes? So let's take a, about five minutes and um, discuss uh, Sammy Lee's story. Uh, so. Um, I'll begin, uh, I'll say that uh, it, I think you said that the, the city's policy was quite clear and that they identified who was in and who was out, but I, I would say just the opposite. Um, when they mention a, a very clear line of who's, you know, that they've established a clear line of who's uh, allowed, they didn't say what that line is, unless it's somewhere else in some other document. In other words, they have the discretion to decide at their leisure who is permitted to swim in the pool on that day and who is not. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there could be a, a little bit of uh, a, a nebulous aspect. Uh, I would say that uh, because I've spoken to people who lived during that time uh, and participated in International Day, and they said it was pretty, pretty well known that um, that it was pretty clear that they couldn't go to the pool on non-international days if you were a person of color. In addition to that, the, the, this did go, this was uh, filed in court in 1919 by the NAACP and it was battled for 27 years in the courts, uh, 28 years till 1947 when it was finally, um, uh, International Day was overturned by the California State Supreme Court. So other thoughts about, and, um, and that was Ted. So Ted, thank you for uh, starting us off. Uh, how, I, I think it's kind of ironic that they called it International Day when clearly, you know, everyone was from everywhere and uh, Pasadena was settled by people from everywhere. So I, I just find it kind of ironic that they called it International Day. Yeah, and that, that's in the letter the, that people of all nations can use a pool on International Day. So uh, that's a good point. And is that Judy? Yes. Thank you, Judy. Um, any other thoughts? Why, why would the city create? Oh, Melba, thank you for raising your hand. I appreciate that. Well, I, I, I think that it was um, a way to, to keep Black people out without them actually saying that um, because I was a child, I was born in the late 40s and, and I'm from Tennessee. And so we did not have access to swimming pools. And so you asked the, the question about Brian's story. And, and I think that when you have that kind of talent and you have someone behind you 
from the larger community, you will take that extra step to make sure that you can get whatever opportunity to excel that you can. But the International Day thing, it 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 was it was purely the racist society in the United States that was keeping anyone of color, as long as you were not of uh, an Anglo-American, you did not count. And so you could not be there. Uh, terrific, thank you Melba for sharing that and especially about your own experience. So Will, we're, we've started a little bit of a line here. Let's go to Pablo and then we'll go to Will after Pablo. Um, oh, I thought it was very interesting that um, the, the, the use of pools for segregation wasn't just for, just in Pasadena, it was sort of a, it was a California phenomenon. I remember when I was doing research on the architect Paul Williams for a, uh, a documentary, uh, there's a 37th Street uh, Y down on 37th and, and Central, and they had a pool, an indoor pool. Um, and kids knew that the other YMCA pools in Southern California didn't allow uh, black kids. So I interviewed this uh, 70 year old man remembers jumping freight cars from uh, Sepulveda Boulevard and riding them all the way to 37th and Central so he could go swimming because the, the YMCA near him on Sentinella didn't allow black kids. And so I feel like um, even though you were saying, you know, it's, it's yes, it's this is a public facility, which makes it a, a very obvious target. But I think also for if you were um, a black child in Southern California, your options for swimming in general, I think, were really limited. Um, anyway, that's all I was thinking. Yeah, I, I, it, in fact, it's a, a nationwide phenomenon. I read about it only just this year in a book called The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, where this is a, a major topic she covers all across the nation, right through the World War II. This was a common practice. Yeah, uh, great points, both Pablo and Ted. And um, as we go to Will, just for all of us to think about, well, why, why did they choose pools? Um, uh, why, what was the angle around pools to um, separate and segregate? All right, Will, what, what were you thinking? Well, uh, pools is pretty obvious. You're mixing bodily fluids and body think fluids. you're going to get the, uh, <laughs> put it bluntly. Uh, I was wondering, first of all, I came in just now. I was at a very interesting session on being an inclusive leader. But that was my point. I may have missed if you said it. Did they drain the pool and refill it after International Day? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay, because that's part of what I consider that there's the, the Yankee problem. I was from North Carolina. We, we were segregations. We were pretty out, open about it. But in the Jim Crow, but I, what I call James Raven is the Yankee way of segregating without making it sound like segregation. And uh, that's been one of the hard ones to fight. Oh, we don't see race around here kind of thing. And in the 30s, it was blatant. But uh, it's, it's clearly, I'm glad the court overruled it because it's clearly bigoted and it's something that I think persists today more than you might think of where we're not prejudiced but and it's hard to fight but it's out there and that's actually a bridge thank you Will that's a bridge to uh, what I'd like us all to be contemplating where does where does um, bias show up today where does discrimination where does uh, racism show up today and how how uh, could we be responding to it? So um, let's move on. And unless there are any other thoughts about Sammy Lee's story, let's move on to the, the next story. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. And Pablo, I can see your lips move, but not- Oh, your sorry, I hit, I hit the camera, but not the, the mic. Why, why didn't that work? Sorry, I was also eating before. That's why the camera was off. Um, there's a picture of Sammy Lee at the Huntington Langham Hotel um, as you're walking towards the pool. And it's a signed picture. Um, and I always found that interesting because I had asked one of the friends at the Altian History Museum and I said, would he have been allowed to swim in this pool? And he said, no, he wouldn't have been allowed to swim in this pool. So it's interesting how, you know, certain institutions, you know, at one point they're segregated and then they 
they decide that they're going to be part of that they'll they'll you know uh, honor somebody later in life you know <laughs> yeah and uh pablo thanks for raising that uh one action item for all of us to be contemplating and i know that the village physically is located fairly close to uh the rose echo and to brookside park and the, the rose bowl aquatic center um be thinking about what the village might be interested in doing around having some sort of an exhibit at the aquatic center some sort of historical representation and is there is there a role for the aquatic center to uh, make a public statement about uh, how international day operated and is there any opportunity for um, some sort of um, uh, redemptive process so I, I just throw that out to the to dick and the rest of the 1619 project as something you might want to follow up on because it's so close to where the village is located so let's move on to uh, our, our next uh, phase. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be a little bit of a review of uh, some of the concepts that we went over a couple of months ago. Uh, so um, please hang on tight. And um, if, if this is something you already know, uh, I look forward to hearing from you on the other end. So we're gonna... Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, redlining, um, Jim Crow, um, segregation, and then also uh, discriminatory practices. So th for those of you who weren't here, this is an image I showed. This is something uh, that I show with my larger presentation. Uh, but does everyone uh, see the sign in the middle of the photograph or anybody not see it? Okay, I see some nodding heads. Uh, anybody want to just come off mute and say what the sign says? The Chinese employed. Thank you, Judy. Uh, <laughs> so what uh, ended up happening in the uh, Pasadena was found uh, was Pasadena was incorporated. Just uh, be clear about the language. Pasadena was incorporated in 1886. Right, we see right from the very beginning. This is 1886. Uh, there were discriminatory hiring practices. So the way it worked was uh, Chinese could work in the field, but they could not work in the packing house. They were not uh, welcome in uh, the area around the packing house or downtown or old Pasadena, but they could uh, stay out in the fields. So um, then to talk a little bit about Jim Crow laws, um, all of you are I'm sure very familiar with the great migration uh, I just use this to, to say this is how some people ended up in Pasadena as opposed to uh, staying in, and we heard uh, people talk about North Carolina and uh, Arkansas, uh, Texas, uh, Mississippi, Alabama. So um, just a point that um, the, the idea was to look for a better life in other parts of the country, and yet because Jim Crow uh, was in California as well, since someone else meant, someone mentioned earlier that it, this was nationwide. So whether it's the swimming pools or it's um, uh, laundry or it's uh, theaters, uh, this is happening everywhere from Delaware to California, North Dakota to Texas, many states impose legal punishments on uh, people for associating with members of another race. So, and just a point, and Pablo I'm sure knows Lynn, but uh, just a point is that Lynn Hudson, West of Jim Crow, The Fight Against California's Color Line is a book that features the Brookside Plunge and she is a graduate of Muir High School and alum. Uh, and one quick quote uh, by Ruby McKnight Williams, who some of you uh, might have known, uh, is I didn't see any difference in Pasadena and Mississippi except that they were spelled differently. <laughs> so it's, it's what many of you have described already about uh, how uh, segregation or um, separation uh, manifests itself in a place like Pasadena. Judy, did you have a comment before we go on? Or? No, no, I didn't. I was just kind of chuckling about uh, Pasadena and, and Mississippi. Yeah, the, so there's a tie and we're, we're gonna talk about that right now and the, the, from the South to uh, California. And again, people coming here for opportunity. And so this, this, has, this story is uh, fascinating because of um, 
what actually happened and how it uh, impacts our lives today. So James Woods, this is, a, this is actually a photograph I didn't show in the last presentation, uh, but James is on the left. This is a shoeshine parlor. This is near Holly and Fair Oaks. This is around 1926. As James moved from Texas to Pasadena, again, because of the great migration in order to find uh, better opportunities, he, uh, during the course of Shining Shoes, he was asked uh, by the Reynolds and Everly Mortuary, which was located in old Pasadena, downtown Pasadena, to work there and to help prepare bodies uh, and to you know, be in the back room assisting with uh, preparation of uh, uh, burials. Uh, James uh, said yes. And uh, what eventually happened is that, um, James, uh, through Reynolds and Everly, they supported him. He said, uh, you know, it's kind of a light bulb type of a moment where he said, you know what, the, this is a business opportunity. So at that time, the Los Angeles School of Anatomy and Bombing and Sanitation did allow people of color to study there. James completed his mortician's cert certification uh, on September 11th, 1926. And then again, with the help of Reynolds and Everly, uh, was able to borrow some a uh, little bit of money to start the James Woods Mortuary, um, which was uh, located on Vernon Avenue. So uh, for some of you who weren't here last time, Vernon Avenue is right in the middle of the 710 freeway stub. So it, it extended from uh, California up to Walnut and there are many, um, uh, if you've gone to the 10 West Walnut um, exhibit, which I encourage all of you to do, um, you can see that this area of the city, and I can show you a map if anybody's interested, was a, a community uh, for people of color. So there were Japanese American businesses, Mexican American businesses, as well as African American businesses, homes, and um, uh, a variety of activities, including James Woods Mortuary. All of this was uh, just, well, taken out, destroyed by the 710 freeway, uh, which uh, is another aspect of all this. So uh, it became Woods Valentine when um, uh, after um, James Woods passed and his nephew took over in the 50s and then the early 60s. And so, uh, but they were forced to move from the old Pasadena location because their area was deemed to be uh, the best area for a freeway. And we could talk about that too. And then um, this is where it is right now. Uh, and I uh, went on a tour there a couple of weeks ago uh, with Gail Valentine. And so they've been serving the community for over 90 years. Actually a friend of mine's uh, mother sadly passed away a couple of months ago and he uh, used Woods Valentine to um, uh, provide the service. So uh, this is a vibrant center for our community and um, is still operating uh, even with, even though it started out as um, an alternate and um, for African-American families. So essentially, um, uh, let's think about a few questions. So uh, first of all, thinking about Jim Crow, why do you think uh, Mr. Woods left Texas for California? Why were Jim Crow laws put in place throughout the country? How do you feel about them? Why was there an opportunity for Mr. Woods to own his own mortuary business? And then um, what examples of racial exclusion or limiting was one's access do you see today? So let's, let's uh, pause again and we'll talk uh, for a few minutes um, and I will stop the share. So um, what are some of your thoughts? Why, why did um, James Woods come to Pasadena? Dick. Well, I don't know why James Woods came to Pasadena, but uh, this listening to this reminds me of a couple of things that I've heard recently. And by the way, I'm a Pasadena resident for about a year. So this, all of this history is, you know, it's things that I'm learning. But uh, we've been working with the uh, Friendship Pasadena Church here, and we recently had a presentation from them. And after that, we had a presentation from Roberta Martinez about Latinos in uh, Pasadena. And out of those two things, I picked up a couple of facts that I found very interesting. One is that the church environment here, uh, Pasadena, the Friendship Pasadena Church was founded seven years after Pasadena itself was. So they go back pretty much to the beginning. 
And from what I understood in that presentation, the churches in this town, in this area, were integrated when they were formed. And so that people of all different ethnic diversity came to the churches, they were not segregated. And then people started moving into Pasadena from the South. And that's when the churches became segregated. Now that's something I picked up from the Friendship Pasadena Church. And then from the uh, Latinos in, in Pasadena presentation, I learned about the great ethnic diversity that existed in Pasadena in its early days. And I was startled to find out how many different ethnic groups were represented here. And for some reason, the one that struck out, stood out to me was there was a significant cohort of Swedish women who came here because of the domestic, domestic market opportunities. They came here as domestics and were apparently a significant uh, group within the population. And I was totally surprised at something like that. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's just a couple of comments that I think that to me add a lot of perspective about where things were when we started and how they evolved and how they changed and uh, a little insight into the history of Pasadena. So that's, that's it. Thanks for sharing, Dick. Um, and uh, let's, I, I want everybody to kind of key into the domestic or the, the worker opportunity and think about um, where those opportunities were and who filled those jobs. Pablo. Yeah, I, I think uh, the racial diversity that, it would, um, that are Pasadena was represented in the early 20th century specifically is exactly, it was because of the job opportunities. Pasadena was created by a group of, of people that didn't want to have an industrial city. They wanted to have a garden city. And a lot of, a lot of the richest families in America, the Bushes, the of Bush Gardens and, and uh, the Wrigley's and et cetera, had huge mansions along uh, Fair Oaks, Mansions Row, or what do they call, multi Millionaire's Row. Right, There was That's also, correct. there was the uh, Green Hotel, the, there was the Raymond Hotel, there was the Huntington Hotel. There were all these, and these weren't, these were like, these are like when you think of a major resort hotel that, that we think of today, like in Hawaii or somewhere. This was like uh, a res places, people would come from all over the United States, the wealthiest people. And the thing that they would love to see is that when the carriage arrived or the car in the early 20th century, that a uh, black man in nice livery would come and open the door for them and they'd go in and they would look at this amazing garden. And because of the, uh, the um, centennial, um, what do you call the World's Fair in Chicago in, two th in 1900, Japanese gardens were the thing. And so if you talk to Naomi Hirahara, the author who uh, was raised in Altadena, uh, whose father was a gardener. A lot of the gardeners weren't actually, they, they, they didn't learn gardening as children. They became gardeners because it was a really good source of income if you were Japanese. People just assumed you would be good at it. Um, so you'd have the Japanese gardener, you'd have the, the black uh, 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 maid or cook. And, and so, but they wanted to have, they would live close. This is why these neighborhoods existed between downtown Pasadena and the Arroyo. Uh, they were close enough to be able to walk to work. And, uh, and so when I think about that, and I think about Northwest Pasadena becoming the place that was the home for Mexicans who were always the traditional laborers of California. You know, they, this used to be Mexico. Um, you know, when they were building the, the, all the infrastructure of Pasadena with generally a Mexican labor staff, uh, I mean, labor crew. Anyway, I'm, I just like, so when I think of like, why did you leave the South? Why, why, would, why did the Great Migration? Well, there were job opportunities. They earned a lot more money and they had a certain amount of more respect. But when you talk about America, you're talking about segregation in all the states. But in the South, it was uh, de jure segregation. It was lit, written into the law that Blacks could only be here and whites could only be here. In California, like the Northeast and the Northwest, it was de facto segregation like the, you know, rarely written down like a plunge, but everybody knew that if you were, you know, black and you were in South Pasadena, you better get out by sundown, right? So that's just another form of segregation. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, I'll, I'll show you a map real quick uh, that demonstrates that. Um, and then um, 
the redlining that occurred to uh, and then the relationship with Millionaire's Row and jobs. Thank you very much, Pablo. Melba. Uh, in, in response to your question about why James would leave the South and go to California, uh, as a child who grew up in 1950s Memphis, Tennessee, there were no opportunities for jobs for Black people. You could work uh, in the kitchen, maybe, of the hospitals. Uh, you could shine shoes. Uh, you could do other uh, domestic work. But other than that, there was very little opportunity for anyone who did not have a college degree or educate high school degree even uh, for Negroes, as we were called at that particular time. And so as a consequence, those of us, the Negroes who were of the lower socioeconomic status in Memphis, migrated to California, to Chicago, so that they could have uh, an opportunity to get a job and to get an education because we were in very segregated little bundles. My little area that I lived in had all Black people. We only had one grocery store and one church in our like 10 block area. And when you went outside of that, everything around you was white. So you had no opportunity to advance or to work or to do things for your family. And so that was my childhood. Yeah. Granted, I grew out of it and I became an MD, but there were many difficult things that I had to go through, go through leaving Memphis, Tennessee to get where I am today. Melba, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, it exemplifies um, the, the reasons for the great migration and then also uh, underscores what Pablo was talking about as far as looking for opportunity. I would redirect us all back to uh, Ruby McKnight Williams comment that said, um, I didn't know uh, that the only difference between Mississippi and Pasadena was that they were spelled differently uh, I think is uh, illustrative of the, the Jim Crow era. Uh, uh, Dick. Yeah, I want to comment on that de jure versus de facto too. Uh, a few years ago, a woman living in Glendale discovered that Glendale was a sundown town and that the regulations were still on the books. They were not being actively enforced uh, at that time, but she discovered that she's living in a sundown town because the regulations were still on the books. And she got busy and started working on that. And I think the story, as the story goes, it took her about 10 years to do it. But in the last year or so, she got a, an apology from Glendale and they officially removed the regulations from the books. And she did it. So there's a, a case of a, a de jure uh, situation here in California. And there were a lot of sundown towns all over the country, which is, <laughs> that's the law. And uh, she told, she came and she did a presentation at one of our earlier uh, presentations and told us the story of how she got that done. Her name was Carol McGrath. And uh, I found that a very interesting story because I'd grown up in the South knowing about sundown towns and thought it was a peculiarly Southern institution, but it was not. They were all over the place. Yeah. And Dick, uh, a quick story. I, you know, growing up in Pasadena, I've had uh, Several of my friends tell me that their parents, uh, who they they worked in the valley, and some of them, you know, for Lockheed Martin and some of the other um, uh, aerospace industry um, companies, that they would have to leave work early or rush, you know, especially in December and January when the days are shorter, so they could get home through Glendale and not have to worry about the uh, the sundown issue. So thank you for bringing that up, Dick. <laughs> Uh, Will, I see you have your hand up. And go ahead and unmute when you're ready. I lived in Pasadena area since uh, from junior high age up through college and beyond. So I know the history there and it shifted part way through. There was definitely more opportunity. The, the institutions in much of the South were, were non-existent or meager for people of color. But in all the country, the validity of the concept of race and racial divides was pretty universal. There were some that said, oh, therefore you can enslave people. And others say, well, no, you can't enslave people, but they don't deserve the first class treatment. But very little of the equality. But the validity of race as a concept 
shifted in the 60s and 70s in this country, and it's still around, that race is a myth. And racism is real, but racism is a myth is a relatively new idea. Um, I would just uh, encourage everyone, if you could, to stay on mute. And it's then, Judy. Uh, if you're not speaking, then, because um, sometimes there's background noises that intrude. And in, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. And Will, um, you know, where Will's going, this is kind of, well, this is the reason why the 1619 Project exists, I would assume, is to be able to um, discuss uh, the current state of race and racism in the United States and then to be able to take action uh, in a positive manner in some way, shape or form, depending on what the, how the group um, determines that. I think awareness is really important, uh, but it's also, uh, discussing uh, both individually and collectively, how might we uh, continue, as I said at the outset, to evolve toward a more inclusive, um, a more um, uh, accepting, embracing society that actually lives up to the democratic ideals of um, some of our constitutionality. So let's go, I wanna show you a map real quick, especially because um, Pablo raised it and um, I'll, uh, just to describe a little bit of what he's talking about. Uh, and, and actually Dick mentioned this too. So with respect to two, two parts, one is the, uh, the Jim Crow, the redlining uh, aspect. And then the other one is the, the notion of employment. So uh, this is, uh, many of you have probably seen, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this map already. Um, so I apologize for, um, uh, repetition, uh, the yellow line in the middle is Colorado Boulevard. Uh, the yellow line that uh, curves around from horizontal to vertical is Orange Grove Boulevard. As uh, Pablo said, Orange Grove was nicknamed Millionaire's Row. Um, we're, I think a lot of this on, our, on this call are familiar with Wrigley's Chewing Gum and Budweiser Beer, uh, and then also Procter & Gamble. Uh, so they were actually literally the billionaires of the day, not just millionaires, they were the the um, Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks of the early 20th century, they, they had so much clout and you know you include the Huntingtons in that as well. Um, so this was a destination place uh, for uh, wealthy individuals and they, but they didn't wanna clean their own, um, they didn't wanna uh, clean their toilets. They didn't wanna mow their lawns. They didn't, uh, they needed people to repair. So the dots on this um, uh, map are, uh, this, this is a city of, Pla city of Pasadena Planning Commission document. It's a, a official document from uh, the city of Pasadena. Each of those dots represents 10 individuals of African-Americans uh, specifically. The, the sector down um, in the lower part below Colorado Boulevard, that's old Pasadena. So if you think about uh, everything from Cheesecake Factory to um, the Rusnak uh, uh, car lot to um, uh, uh, 85 degrees um, bakery and below, that is where folks live. And that's where Friendship Baptist Church, and I'm sure that when you talk to Friendship, they, they shared this as well. The two points, one is it was walking distance to Orange Grove. So if people did find employment along Millionaire's Row, they could walk up Green or Del Mar or Colorado Boulevard, Walnut. They could walk over to the Gamble House and um, work for the, the Gambles. Uh, the other aspect is the blue lines are rail lines and the blue line to the right that goes vertically and then horizontally, that was a Southern Pacific Railroad. And at the Del Mar station where we have the gold line today, that's where uh, the train station was located. Uh, and uh, as a child, I used to go there and see my grandparents off to go back east to Pennsylvania. Um, but in the early 20th century, uh, that was connected to the Green Castle Green or the Green Hotel, and they needed porters. They needed people to uh, carry luggage. They needed people to sort baggage. They needed people to maintain all of the systems. So there were jobs there as well. Um, what I 
what I want to actually, um, I'm going to stop the share for a second and go to the next part. So um, Pablo mentioned uh, the Japanese American community. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, this will be our next story. Um, so there is a place called the Bellefontaine Nursery, which uh, still exists. Um, and so we, we want to take a moment uh, where now imagine where all those dots were right uh, in old Pasadena at the kind of the bottom of those dots uh, at 838 uh, South Fair Oaks is where uh, the Uchida family founded uh, the Bellefontaine Nursery in 1939. Uh, on the right, you see the, the Uchida brothers and some cousins. And this is, um, this is a, a, another Pasadena business that has survived uh, quite a few challenges over the years. Uh, so when thinking about um, some of the issues of uh, World War II and uh, uh, internment camps, which a lot of people, um, some people call uh, prison camps, some people call them concentration camps. Um, they, uh, the Uchida family was relocated to uh, Arizona. And so they spent uh, from 42 to 45 uh, at the uh, internment camp or concentration camp in Arizona, Gila River. Um, and Fortunately for them, when they were released, uh, they were able to come back to their business. And the reason was is that neighbors and friends uh, watched the business while they were gone. They, they enabled them to, again, the reason why I bring this up is this didn't happen for a lot of people. Um, a lot of folks uh, had to, um, uh, start all over because uh, someone else had moved into their business or it had been destroyed or um, they, they just didn't have access. But the Uchidas were fortunate because their neighbors cared for them. Uh, and to Pablo's point, um, Pasadena was because of, well, as a part because of all these wealthy large homes, there was a demand for gardeners. And many of those gardeners, uh, certainly from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even into the 70s, they were Japanese. And so Bellefontaine Nursery, and you can see the building, it's, uh, it's operating today, it's doing well. Uh, it's garden supply, um, it's there on Fair Oaks. And um, this particular photograph was in 1953, uh, but the building is pretty much the same. Uh, so uh, one quick story was that uh, it was tough coming back from World War II um, and getting the business started again. So what Mr. Uchida had to do was he had to take on some side jobs and his side jobs were uh, to actually mow lawns. So he rode his bicycle from the shop over to say Orange Grove uh, and with his push mower on the back, he would uh, mow the lawns and then he would reattach the, the push mower. And I'm sure some of the people on this call have pu pushed a hand powered mower um, before there was um, gas mowers. Um, so you know how hard work that is. And then he would uh, uh, ride it back to the store and then help to build a business that way. So um, because Pablo had raised this, I, this is sort of a divergence. This wasn't in the original uh, talk, but I thought I would bring it up as well. So thank you, Pablo, for um, getting us off track. So I wanna go back to, um, uh, yeah. How were the core? How were the Japanese core support group able to watch the property when they were also in concentration camps? It wasn't great question. Thank you for asking that. I wasn't clear. It wasn't um, Japanese who yeah. watched the property. It was other neighbors. Uh, and I'm I I'm gonna Pablo. You might be able to help me with this, but I'm gonna do more research. I'm guessing because of the neighborhood, it was African American and. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mexican American neighbors who watched the property. Any thoughts, yeah. Pablo? Well, my my uh, wife's family also were sent to Gila River. They were farmers up near Fresno, and they came back. and a And a local farmer who was white took care of their um, 
didn't do crops, but you know, made sure that nobody got into the building and, and helped them get their uh, deed back. It, it was usually somebody who was actually just a nicer than most people, but it was not the norm. Most, most of the people, if you know the story of Little Tokyo, for example, almost, uh, I think they said almost 80% became, uh, was taken by other people and they had to basically buy back their properties. Exactly. Thank you for um, those details, and that—that's exactly what I would, what I find it, found as well. Uh, so um, many of you know where this is. Um, I'm sure many of you have walked by it before. Uh, quick uh, trivia question: You can come off mute. Why? Why are they looking different directions? And who who is on the right and who's on the left? Or uh, oh. I feel like I'm dominating, but I know the answer. Okay, well, Pablo, hang on to that for a second okay. see if anybody else. So two questions, who, who's on the right, who's on the left? And then um, why are they looking different directions? Okay, I see no takers. We've stumped them once again. <laughs> I, and that, I'm sad too, because that Dick had promised me some uh, gift or some prizes and I think this one was for the Hawaii trip, wasn't it, Dick? <laughs> so, um, and, and, and Pablo doesn't uh, qualify because he knows all this anyway. So I Pablo, have a, why? I have an why? idea. Oh, okay. I, I think Jackie is facing east because he got involved with the um, Brooklyn Dodgers uh, in New York. And maybe uh, Mac is facing City Hall because he was more um, involved uh, with the city and more involved uh, in, uh, in Pasadena. Just a guess. Yeah, great guess. Uh, so um, Jackie is on the right and Mac is on the left. And that's uh, essentially it. The, um, my understanding that the artist uh, placed Jackie looking east Obviously, he was with the Brooklyn Dodgers, broke the color line, et cetera, et cetera. But he never came back to Pasadena. And there are many quotes uh, uh, by him saying, uh, I, you know, you really couldn't drag me back there uh, because I had a terrible experience. So his view was always to the East Coast. He ended up moving to Connecticut, which is where he passed. And uh, the only times that he came back to Pasadena were when um, uh, there were family activities. Mac, on the other hand, on the left, uh, came back to Pasadena after he was in the Olympics. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about Mac. And he, um, he was uh, kind of a thorn in the side of city council. At that time, it was called the Board of Directors. He was, uh, he was an advocate. He was an activist. He, he was uh, in City Hall for many, many, many years. And so the artist wanted to honor his commitment to creating a more equitable place by uh, having him look directly at City Hall where he worked so many years. Pablo, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, there's a, there's a lot of stories regarding Mac. Um, uh, well, the, the one that always gets me is that he uh, uh, had graduated John Muir High School. The very next year, he went to the Olympics. Um, and uh, well, there you go. And he won the silver medal in 200 point, uh, a four tenths of a second behind Jesse Owens. And if he had had new shoes, he says he would have won, but he was wearing the same running shoes he had had at John, at, at John Muir Technical High School. Um, and then when he returned, um, the only people waiting for him at the train station was his family. Like nobody from the city actually arrived to celebrate their Olympic hero. Um, and then they gave him a job as a street sweeper which he would do wearing his Olympic uh, sweatshirt um, and wearing his silver medal as to spite them. And then he went off to Oregon to, to college, but that's, uh, and he was working at John Muir High School when I was a student. And uh, anyway, that's all I have to say. Great, so let's, let's uh, talk a couple, let's make a couple of other comments about what, uh, to add to what Pablo said. Well, one part of, um, he was, Mac was, so uh, there's quite a bit of focus on Jackie. The reason why I bring up Mac, it, one is because he, he uh, 
work, he came back to Pasadena, he tried to make it a better place. But two, his story is um, in many ways even more, uh, or is a dramatic story. I won't say that it's more dramatic than Jackie's because Jackie suffered tremendously as the first African-American in Major League Baseball. Uh, but Max is less known. And so we wanna raise him up and talk a little bit about his experience and some of the background was that he, uh, you know, it says he's state champion of California in the 100 yard dash. Uh, fun fact, he did not lose a 100 yard race his entire senior year, dozens and dozens of races. He won every single one. And it's, it's rare even today to find um, athletes who are so dominant in a particular race. Um, and yes, he was only uh, four tenths of a second behind Jesse Owens. Uh, and, and yes, that's absolutely true that he wore shoes that were aged, worn out, and um, certainly technologically not um, competitive. And yet he still was in second place. Now, another part of the story is that obviously, uh, well, a couple of things. One is, uh, a, uh, Adolf Hitler was in the stands and he wasn't too happy about what happened. But subsequently, uh, so Jesse and, um, and Mac uh, were one, two in the 200. So the four by 100 relay was coming up and the four by 100, obviously that's kind of the marquee race of the entire Olympics. That's what everyone's looking for, who, which nation is gonna be the fastest. And so Mac was not allowed he, so uh, he was on the original team, but the original fastest team was four black athletes. The coach decided, hey, you know what? We need to have racial balance here because this is the very first fun fact. Um, this was the first broad television broadcast Olympics ever. And so they didn't want to be broadcasting back in the United States and have four black athletes one run right after the other they wanted to diversify. So they picked the two fastest white athletes and put them on the four by one relay with Jesse Owens and another runner, another African-American runner. Uh, and Mac was very disappointed about that. And he, and the US still won the gold medal, but he felt like they, they obviously would have been faster, but they could have um, you know, set a world record. One other thing was after, um, Mac and Jesse, and then some of the other black athletes won their um, awards. Adolf Hitler sent a note to uh, President Roosevelt and he said, you should be embarrassed having uh, these people of color representing your country um, because it's, uh, it's, it's shameful. We should only have whites who are participating in these sorts of events. One other uh, tidbit uh, disturbing and disgusting is that President Roosevelt invited all of the uh, Olympic athletes to the White House afterward to honor them. He did not allow the 14 uh, black athletes to attend that event. So Mac was not allowed to go, even Jesse Owens was not allowed to go. So, and then back to um, uh, Pablo's point, what did, what did Mac find when he came back? And so I wanna ask you all a question, we'll, we'll talk for a couple minutes um, as we're moving forward is um, how are Olympic athletes treated today? If you, if you have a gold medal, uh, you know, just think of Michael Phelps, how, how has he been treated with all of his gold? Um, and how was Mac treated? Uh, Mac could only find a job as a street sweeper. And as Pablo pointed out, he would sweep the streets with his Team USA sweatshirt uh, as he performed the ugly task. One of the, um, other aspects of this story that's related to the pool is that during the course of the NACP's court case filing, the city uh, became really upset. So this is, so he would, they were in um, uh, 1936, right? So in 1937, 38, oh no, Mac went to Oregon for a couple of years and then he came back. So this is probably 38, 39 timeframe. Uh, the city was really upset about this court case. So what it did was it um, uh, retaliated and fired all of its black employees in around 1938, 1939. 
and Robinson was included in that. So this quote by him, I think is really uh, illustrative as well. If anybody in Pasadena was proud of me, other than my family and close friends, they never showed it. And as uh, Pablo stated, no one came to see him at the train station. The only time I was noticed was when someone asked me during assembly at school if I'd race against a horse. So how, how do we treat um, people who have an extraordinary legacy in our community. Um, and this is another reason why I, I bring up Mac instead of Jackie is that as he stayed and he was a thorn in the side of city government right up to the very end, um, he advocated for um, improving the streets, improving the quality of neighborhoods, uh, for more recreation for kids, for expansion of playgrounds, the, um, the integration of pools, uh, he, he worked diligently after the Los Angeles riots um, in 1992. He raised money for Olympic athletes and he volunteered uh, for many of the organizations, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club and uh, some of the others here in Pasadena. Um, so I, I feel as though um, Mac's legacy is extraordinary here in Pasadena and we should, we should be talking about him. So um, what did you learn? So just uh, we'll have another uh, brief conversation. What did you learn about Pasadena from Mac's story? Um, how would you have responded um, if you were in Mac's shoes uh, returning from the Olympics? How are Olympic athletes treated today? Um, uh, and what caused that change over time? And then if you could talk to Mac, uh, what would you say to him? So let's uh, pause for a minute and have a little bit of a discussion. I'm sorry. Sorry, I said so much of that story before you. I didn't know what your slideshow was, Brian. Sorry. Next time I'll brief you uh, before before I go live. And by the way, this is all uh, new material. I'm uh, or newer, not new, but it's this. What this is not in the the presentation that I gave uh, two months ago. This is all different. So. Um, any, any thoughts about uh, Mac's experience and um, his place in Pasadena history? I'll just, it's not about that, but I'll just make one small point of clarification. That Hawaiian trip you referred to, that was actually a package of macadamia nuts. Yeah, well, I bet it was two packages, right? Oh, two packages. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We, might, we might negotiate that. Yeah, thanks for your generosity, Dick. I'm sure that <laughs> we operate crowd... on we operate on a low budget here. Yeah. Uh, so again, um, what did you learn uh, from uh, the stories that Pablo and I shared about uh, Mac Robinson, and how does that make you feel about um, uh, Pasadena's history? Well, it helps me understand. I, I mean, I've I've only heard that Pasadena was was extremely racist, and I'll well, just I'll leave it at that. Racist uh, up until, say, the fifties or so. Um, I didn't know any of that history. I was born in fifty eight here in uh, Pasadena, and I was part of the uh, the busing experiment. Um, I, I'd eventually like someone to answer your several questions, the question you asked several times about how we experience racism today. Uh, I'll note that all the examples we've seen so far end in the, say, early 50s or so, maybe in the 60s. Um, so I, I, that's what I'm listening for. Great. Thanks, thanks for um, kind of circling us back to that, that question as well. And Ted, you might want to talk to Pablo at some time uh, because you you did attend school here, and and that's what his film is all about. Um, so any any other thoughts? And we can, if if no one wants to comment about Mac Robinson and his story, we can start talking about uh, what are the current issues that we're facing today with respect to uh, equity and justice and fairness. Um, I know Pablo has one at the top of his uh, list, but it would be nice to hear from, from everyone. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes left at the most. So um, Dick, 
I'll just say my reaction to that story is I'm not a bit surprised by any of that, but the way I think of it, it's like an ugly smell coming from behind the wall and you open up the wall and you see what's there. And that's kind of the reaction I have to that story. It's just the ugly details of what, what I'm not at all surprised by. Yeah, and um, uh, that that's a very uh, visceral sort of an example uh, because yes, that's what happened when you look by behind the wall, you find all of the uh, mold and mildew there. So thank you, Dick. Uh, Melba. Um, well, looking at racism today and yesterday, I think we have actually gone full circle. Uh, I see the racist attitudes of the 1950s and 60s that I experienced as a child um, evident again today. Oh. Uh, we, are, we are still, we went through a phase where we were of affirmative action and trying to get better opportunities, educational opportunities, job opportunities for uh, Blacks, uh, African-Americans, our, our names have gone through so many changes from Negro to color to whatever. Um, and we're back there now with the affirmative action. And so I, as a professional Black physician and an all white elitist operating room was treated horrendously uh, and heard comments that having me around was like having a Black cat floating around. Oh. Fast forward to today, and I now have a child, you know, who is one of the Black women in Biden's administration now. And so I've seen all of these different shifts personally in my life and in my children's lives. And so from looking at and listening to a lot of young Black people now, they don't have that I'd say the, the 40 year olds now have that desire uh, to, to get more opportunities for the race as a whole. But when you go back to your teenagers, the, the lower twenties, they're sort of passive and satisfied with where they are without that fight in them that we had in the 1960s. And that I think maybe our 40 year olds now, for, yeah, between 40 and 50 year olds now are beginning to have some of that passion again to get racial equality, promise of, of, of jobs and, and promotions and, and being in the public eye. Melba, thank, thank you for that story. Uh, quick, uh, and this is a question for you, but uh, for everyone, is based on what Melba said, is uh, what, what needs to be done in society today to ensure that we keep moving toward a more inclusive um, community? Um, and, and what, and, and there, there are probably a multitude of responses uh, but again, there's both the individual action and then the collective one. But I'd love to hear some ideas on, especially if, if Melba is feeling as though we're moving backwards instead of forwards, what, what can we all be doing to try to um, continue uh, toward an inclusive society? Uh, Will? Well, basically, uh, I think the locus of need has shifted somewhat. I've heard many people saying, uh, Ibrahim X. Kendi among others, changing the institutions, the government, the schools and so on is vital at this point, because there's some sense that you don't educate people and then institutions change. Once the institutions are changed, equity becomes the norm and people conform to the new norm, uh, particularly because it seems that what I see is a return to I agree with Melba. It not only has been a retrenchment against even teaching about race in schools, for example, and not the, it's been politicized where the Republican party seems to be fairly comfortable about being racist in many respects, which is disappointing because it was a major, is a major party. So that's a problem. We've got, we've got retrenchment. 
I think the opportunity, though, is what we have gained. That I mentioned having just come back from, I was at a organize a a a program on this is an engineers being inclusive in the way engineering is taught, and it's a very very uh, thoughtful and detailed presentation. When I get the uh, references, I'll bring it. So there are books to be made in changing institutions and recognizing that you don't have to be a liberal Democrat to be an anti-racist work for equity. Uh, thank you, Dorsey. Um, thanks, Will. I, th I think we we heard pretty much everything that you had to say. Uh, but the key key point was changing institutions. Uh, any of you heard of critical race theory? Um, so, and I, I don't I don't raise that to uh, you know create any sort of a um, a debate. Uh, just by raising that, that's the example of what. Will is talking about is the, the, the institutional aspect. If we can't even have discussions about uh, what race means to us in society today, or and even study what Melba was talking about historically, then um, it, it's extremely difficult to um, move young people or move society toward this uh, inclusive vision that I was talking about. So, um, uh, Dick, I would take I would take a little bit of exception to that interpretation. I do not think that we're going back to where we were. I think what's happening is that we're seeing a resurfacing of some terrible stuff in part of our society. But I think it's resurfacing into a world that's quite different. And I, I take a lot of encouragement from looking at the people who are in elected public office today. And we got some really bad people in there, but we also have a mix of a lot of different groups in there who have never been positions of power before. And we see that all the way through the administration. And Melba referred to it in the fact that her one of her daughters is prominent or is active in the Biden administration. And another of her daughters is very prominent in, in another field. So, and she's a doctor herself. And so we're, we're in a different world today. And I think that this group and things like this group are making a contribution to raising awareness and getting the word out and having people understand more about where we are. So I, I think that we're working in our own way to, to making the world a better place by doing what we're doing here. Yeah, uh, Dick, I think you're right. It's um, the, the reality is that, you know, we won't necessarily, although the way uh, uh, voting has been eroded uh, the last few years. We won't necessarily go back to 1860. Yeah, it's very frightening or, what's happening with voting. Mm. We, we, and, and yet uh, there is a change that is, um, that is extremely disturbing uh, that's going on right now. So, um, Will, I see your hand up. Uh, is there any, Will, is yeah. there anyone yeah. else that before we go back to Will, I just want to, with the limited time we have, is there anyone else that would like to weigh in on this topic before we go back to Will? Uh, I'll just note that uh, where I work, um, uh, DE&I, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion programs are being actively promoted and supported and, uh, you know, vigorously promoted. And, you know, I, that's fine with me. I'm sort of agnostic on that, but I will say that uh, cancel culture is very strongly active too. For example, you will not hear an institutionally supported discussion on uh, critical race theory. So it's not a fair environment. That's Good all. point. And just a footnote, we'll go to you, Toby, next. Just a footnote is that uh, in the work that I'm doing, uh, we've expanded the thinking uh, not just DEI, but it's called IDEA. So it's inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, just to keep that in mind. So it's a little bit broader definition of what we should be talking about. So Toby. Um, I, I think a lot of people have alluded to this cancel culture, the, the idea of legislating and making law 
what we can discuss and not discuss, what our children can learn in school and not even have exposure to, how are they supposed to even think about making decisions or critical thinking or, um, it scares me. It scares me terribly. Um, I do take heart that not everybody feels that way. And I worry that not enough everybody doesn't feel that way. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm guardedly hopeful. And because there's nothing, if I'm not hopeful in some way, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to become impassive and depressed. <laughs> so, you know, we have to move forward. And, and I think that, I don't remember whose quote it was, but there's something about acting without faith. Um, maybe, maybe I don't believe, I certainly don't believe in my lifetime, but you know, that I'll see what I want in this lifetime, but it's my grandkids. It's seven generations. It's the planet. It's just plain what is decent. And so I'm very passionate about it. <laughs> and then, and I'm moving to Pasadena. So I'm looking forward to joining you all um, soon. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome Toby. And then, Thanks. And then on another is just, this is very small and very individual, but we can make choices who we give our money to. We can support businesses of people of color and women of color and women. <laughs> um, and, you know, sometimes I go, what can I do? It's so enormous it's just overwhelming i want to pull the covers over my head mm -hmm. and then i go well yeah but i could go to a different bookstore i could you know and so anyway that's that's introduction to me <laughs> wonderful thank you so much toby uh dick did you, do uh are we going to evaporate in a minute and a half well it's not going to blow us away i have to turn us off but uh I, I would I would want to contribute a couple of quotes from Ellie Wiesel that I think might be appropriate here. I know everybody I think knows who Ellie Wiesel is. He was, wrote a lot about the Holocaust and was involved with that. But he had two quotes that I think are relevant. One he said is, "Listening to a witness makes you a witness," and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. What we're doing here is listening listening to witnesses and learning from that and becoming witnesses. And the other thing that he said is that we have to address the irrationality of evil with the irrationality of hope. Uh, and I thought yeah. that was appropriate for, and I, I refer to that specifically, yeah. and Toby mentioned something that brought that to mind. Yeah. Great. So Dick, and I want to ask everybody on the call, can we stay just a couple more uh, minutes because Angelina has raised her hand. I'd like to uh, hear from her and I'm sure Will has something, and I think Pablo had his hands raised too. Could we? Is sure, we'll just, okay we'll just keep going. There's nothing automatic cutting us off. It's when we finish. Okay. Um, so why don't we why don't we go in this order? We'll go Will, uh, Pablo, and Angeline, because um, I think that's what I saw the hand. Or Pablo, you didn't have your hands up, did you? Okay. So we'll go Will, and then Angeline. Uh, we'll wrap up with Angeline. Okay, well, I'll just be very brief here. What I, I want to echo what Dick started saying, and I think Toby also said, uh, again, back to this uh, session I was in for inclusive leadership and engineering, they talked about how to make change is rather than uh, bewailing the problems, work on a strength-based approach where you celebrate what you're beginning to realize because it focuses you and gives you more energy to make the change. And so that's an approach that I think we can look at. So it gets very easy to get discouraged when they hear somebody sound like, oh, these awful people. But a strength-based approach, celebrating what you're doing is a positive 
way to make change. Thank you very much, Will. Angeline, you ready? I am. To, I, I will be honest and say I don't necessarily have a comment specifically to any of the questions that were raised, but I, I wanted to say that I'm in Jamaica, um, but I am serving as um, the intern minister at Neighborhood UU. And, um, and so one of the things that is important to me is to understand both the history of Pasadena, but also understanding the congregants I do work with, particularly um, or Black and African American congregants. And so as an outsider, a very, very far outsider, being able to, to, to hear and to learn so much of between this conversation and some that have happened at the church, the history of Pasadena and understanding not just, you know, that space of history doesn't always stay as history because it's always present and it's always affecting. And I think in some of the ways that Melba spoke about how things are either um, returning to something of the past or resurgence of, of things that we don't necessarily want to see. And so I'm I'm appreciative of the conversation and of this presentation, and I just wanted to, to state that as somebody who is external to the community, but like Toby, move into the community at some point in the near future. So thank you. Thank you for being here, Angeline. And if I can be of any support or assistance to you in your work, please let me know. And I think um, I'm going to volunteer Pablo too. I'm sure he would be uh, willing to support you. So I just want to take a, a, Pablo, did you want to? Brian, can I say one quick thing? Yes, I didn't see your hand. This is it. Sandy. As a long-term resident of Pasadena, I never knew Mac's story. I never knew those incredible sufferings and efforts that he made. And I think to help us through these stories is to lean, like Will said, on the positive side of the courage that it took Mac to do that. And that these are like-minded people that are all here right now, and we can pass on that kind of courage through these stories. And you're doing it. Thank you, Brian. Excellent. Thank you for, uh, and that leads me into, I uh, just, uh, just some closing observations real quick. One, so um, I just want to raise up uh, some of the areas that I see where um, we're having issues still um, within our society. So it's education, as we talked about, it's police community relations, it's housing, it's uh, voting rights, which is uh, several of you mentioned today, it's access to capital or access to um, uh, jobs. Uh, and then it's technology and te technological access. So uh, there is inequity in all of those areas. And we, today is not the day for us to break all those down, but I just wanted to raise those up. So for you to be thinking about which one you wanted to pick uh, to work on, whether that's voting rights or education, et cetera. Then I, I also wanted to summarize what I heard as far as solutions, or at least some actions uh, that we could all take. So uh, one is to change institutions uh, and to be thinking about institutional change in particular in education, uh, but also in government. Uh, it's to uh, expand and utilize uh, what I call the idea training or some people call DEI training. Uh, it's to teach critical thinking skills. And I want to underscore that one because I, I, I believe in that one as well. Uh, it's the ability to raise awareness and people who are not aware of these stories. Uh, it's to support um, uh, businesses that are owned by people of color and uh, owned by women. Uh, so walk uh, your dollars where they have value. Uh, and then it's listening to witnesses and listening to stories uh, and and being inspired and motivated by those stories. Um, uh, it's thinking about a strength-based approach and thinking about what assets we do have. Uh, and then the last one is to try to celebrate our work whenever there's uh, an accomplishment or there's um, a moment when uh, we actually have made progress. It's to take time to step back and say, 
this is wonderful. This is amazing. Let's celebrate with our colleagues and um, be joyful as we move forward in the work. So those are, that's all of your words. That's what I heard all of you say. So I think this has been a very productive conversation. And um, so I hope that you leave it with a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more inspiration, and then a little bit more um, action to be able to take both again, individually and collectively. So I wanna thank Dick for allowing me to do this. And I wanna thank Lucinda for showing Power of One uh, without uh, being prompted to do so. so. So thank you for doing that. So oh, great, well, thank you very much, Brian. Really appreciate you doing this. And thanks to everybody for coming and stay in touch and keep up the good work. And, and we can hope that we can make a change. And actually, Dick, before you go, um, maybe Pablo, do you want to talk just for a second about uh, your film and PBS and those sorts of things? Because I think this is another way to increase our awareness. Well, I put in the link uh, or in a link to the film in the chat. If anyone's interested, it's on PBS SoCal. It's finishing its broadcast. I think it's one more showing on KCET, but it's going to be, they just told me yesterday, it got so many streams that they're going to keep it on their streaming network for two years. So it's going to be there for quite a while. Um, and it's basically a look at the passing of schools uh, through well, uh, my experience as a as a alum and then uh, and the idea of would I send my son to John Muir High School today, which was the school that I went to. Um, and it's it's won a lot of awards. It's uh, um, I think it's it's worth an hour of your time if you're interested in these topics. And feel free to contact me. Um, I'll type in my email as well uh, if you'd like to discuss it further. There you go. And uh, this has been great, Brian. I really appreciate all your talks and 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 on some of the things that I learned from Brian, Brian's last talk snuck into this PBS feature version. And so uh, very instrumental. Thank so, you. So hopefully I'm in the credits somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. And thanks, Dick, for this opportunity. All right, great. Thanks to everyone. Keep up the good work.